Hello everyone, welcome to Stealing with Chantel. I'm Chantel and this is Ty. Hi, my name is Jamie Goodpaster. I'm the chief of Jessamine County EMS. This is uh, another piece of cool uh, STEM technology. This is our infusion pump. And this infusion pump, um, it basically takes the medication we want to deliver and ensures we're delivering it accurately. Now in the past, with uh, traditional EMS service, not many EMS services have this. We're one of the only ones in this area that have traditional IV pumps. Uh, we really want to make sure that the medication you're being delivered is an accurate amount of medication. You're not being overdosed or underdosed on medication. When we do what's called gravity infusions, where we let gravity uh, 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 pull the medication into your body and then we count the drip rate, um, we don't feel like that's safe for some of the medications we give. So we really want to make sure that when we give you a medication, we're as safe as possible. In addition, below that, you'll see that we have something called a medication administration cross-check. This medication administration cross-check is something that our providers and maybe even patients, they might even ask you to help them do a medic medication administration cross-check, cross -check, um, they might do to make sure that we're giving you the right medication, the right dose at the right time. All right, so this is, uh, uh, this is really important th uh, step in administering all medications with, on an ambulance. You might also see that we have um, some seat belts, and we prefer that our uh, ambulance providers are always seat belted at all times. As you can imagine, sometimes this just isn't possible. Um, but uh, we're working to make sure that we have uh, specific restraint systems in our ambulances uh, where they can stay belted at all times. And so, and of course, the patient is always going to be belted and, and any safety restraint on our ambulance. All right, underneath the bench seat. There's really not a piece of space that goes unused in an ambulance underneath the bench seat. Underneath the bench seat, you might find some common splints, um, a, a black bag or a body bag in case we, uh, um, unfortunately, if we have someone that um, needs to be placed in one of those that has, uh, that has died. Um, and so we have a few things like that. And then over here we have some uh, oxygen cylinders you can actually access on the outside of the truck and down here on the inside of the truck if we need more oxygen really relatively quickly all right and now i guess we can talk about the um, cardiac monitor all right so the cardiac monitor is essential to an ems system it does it has so much functionality they're very expensive um, and but it has so much functionality that literally almost every patient is going to be put on this cardiac monitor for some type of diagnostic or uh, uh, diagnostic therapy and or some actual treatment therapy. So our cardiac monitor is, uh, this is our newest cardiac monitor. These are really small. Um, they used to be really big. They used to weigh a lot. They used to hurt every paramedic and EMTs back in the country. And now they've really started making them quite small. We've got it on our uh, on our uh, mount. Um, we have to make sure that everything in the ambulance is uh, secured and mounted whenever we're transporting a patient. And so this is a mount where we can stand here and still access the cardiac monitor and access the patient. And it's secure and won't come off. These have been tested uh, and are certified to uh, withstand uh, 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 certain collisions and certain speeds. So uh, in the cardiac monitor, there's a lot of cool functionality. So let me go through some of the functionality. All right, so traditionally, if you've taken a CPR course, you might know what an AED is, or an automatic external defibrillator. Well, it has one of those built in. But the layperson might use an AED, or an EMT might use an AED, but an advanced EMT or a paramedic, um, they might use, or really traditionally a paramedic, I should say, the paramedic is gonna use um, the more advanced features of the cardiac monitor. There are some features that an AMT can use, but really the paramedic gets the most utility out of the defibrillation section of the, of the cardiac monitor. So 
as a layperson or an EMT basic uh, or just a regular EMT, um, they're going to use the AED function. A paramedic is going to choose the energy that they deliver to the patient and they're going to uh, actually defibrillate at the, when they want to defibrillate, as in they're going to push a button to shock the patient after they've selected the energy and determined if it's a shockable rhythm or not. Instead of the monitor doing that, because it's a little bit slow, it can be slow, um, we're going to let our paramedics look at the actual rhythm. Um, there's, there's generally four rhythms that we're, gener that we're looking for, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, asystole, or PEA. Those are the four big ones that we generally want to look for, whether we determine whether it's a shockable rhythm or a non-shockable rhythm. And so our paramedics will look at it, determine whether it's a shockable rhythm or not, and set the energy and deliver a shock. The AED is going to make you pause to analyze the patient's heart rhythm and then tell you whether or not, not a shock is advised or not. So that's the two key differences between a paramedic and an AMT when they utilize a defibrillator. Um, other items uh, that this uh, monitor can do uh, and other therapies that this monitor can do is we have our bundle. And our bundle is a blood pressure cuff. So we'll take automatic blood pressure readings with this. It'll hook in right here. And uh, we'll take, it'll automatically inflate the blood pressure cuff. It'll take really accurate measurements. It has this dual, or has this dual feed um, uh, blood pressure uh, um, tool. That way uh, we get really accurate measurements with this cuff. We also have in this bundle our SpO2 or pulse oximetry. We're going to put this on a finger and that's going to give us what the blood oxygen of the patient is. Similar to the new Apple Watches, if you're familiar, it might give you your blood oxygen. This is much more specific and sensitive, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's one of the first manufacturers of uh, pulse oximetry. We have that technology in here, uh, made by Massimo, which is the company, generally, that you'll see. All right, and then we have our electrodes. This is what we call a three lead, even though there's four leads. We're looking at three different views of the heart. Um, and so we'll put this on a particular, we'll put this on a patient with electrodes that we have right here. And we'll put them at specific areas of the body so we can get specific views of the heart. Now this is important. A paramedic is the only one on the ambulance that can actually read and interpret an ECG or an EKG. Um, EKGs are important for a few functions. We can tell if you're having a heart arrhythmia. We can tell if you're having an ST elevation or ST elevated myocardial infarction, fancy word for heart attack, um, and we can and we can tell if you're having any other uh, uh, vascular heart changes that uh, we might want to look into um, down the road. We could even tell if you have an electrolyte imbalance based on your ECG. So uh, it's really important. Paramedics go through a lot of education and a lot of training and a lot of competency to know how to read these and how to use these. Um, uh, the, this is just uh, one portion. We could get a, a, a better view of the heart with something called a 12-lead ECG. And our 12-lead ECG has, just has more electrodes that we're going to put along your, uh, along your chest, right along here. Um, it just allows us to see more views of the heart. Because every Think of these as little cameras. The way our heart works is we actually have electrical signals running through our heart. And that's what make up our ECG. You know, our, our atria, um, they fire, and then our ventricles fire um, using certain nodes in our heart. If there's an issue with a pathway of those nodes, that's called an arrhythmia. If we have a blockage and we have strain on the heart, that's called a, uh, angina or myocardial infarction generally is what we're going to see when we see the ST elevation in a certain segment of the ECG. So these are little cameras of the heart, just so we can see different sides of the heart to make sure all sides of the heart are working the way that they need to. Because we have four chambers and we want to make sure all four chambers are doing all the things that they need to do. All right, and um, over here, we have our uh, pads, our uh, defibrillator pads. These aren't just for uh, the defibrillation that you might be familiar with in a cardiac arrest patient. These are also for transcutaneous pacing uh, or synchronized cardioversion. Synchronized cardioversion, we kind of talked about earlier. This is where at a certain portion of your ECG, um, uh, uh, the monitor, the technology in the monitor, the programming in the monitor will pick that up, uh, uh, pick out that spot, 
and then when we shock that, it will shock specifically at that spot, um, so it will uh, uh, correct the arrhythmia uh, that it needs to correct. Generally, a, 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 a wider, narrow, complex tachycardia that's not fixed by medication. In addition, we have something called transcutaneous pacing that a paramedic may do. Transcutaneous pacing is when, let's say, you have a patient that has a really low heart rate or something called a heart block. A heart block is not the same thing as a heart attack. A heart block is where the electrical signals in your heart have a blockage where it's not transmitting the electrical, electrical signals all the way down to your ventricles or down to the Purkinje fibers. Um, and... Uh, we have a blockage there, so we have to correct that blockage or we have to correct the rate uh, issue that you have. Heart rate's low. We're going to put these pads on and using electricity and using electricity in the monitor, we're going to set a certain heart rate for you and it's going to give you small electrical jolts. It's going to defibrillate you just with a small amount of energy every however many seconds or whatever rate we set it at so it keeps your heart beating at that certain rate. All right, so that's a really important tool. It's really important to keep patients alive until we get to the hospital um, so we can try to stabilize them with some more advanced medications we might not uh, carry on the ambulance or surgical interventions such as ablations and things of that nature. All right. Over here we have larger cuffs for, uh, and smaller cuffs for pediatric patients and larger individuals. And then we have quick reference guides on how to work the monitor or if there's any advanced function that we're uh, that, uh, you know, that we're, uh, that, you know, we're pretty competent on these. We generally don't need these, but if there's an advanced feature, like we're trying to transmit our information to our electronic health record, um, we might use this to make sure that we know how to do that in the monitor, that we're not missing a step on that monitor. All the key clinical features we train on constantly, and we have quarterly competencies to assure that we do well. So you can trust in us that we know how to use this monitor very, very well, but we can always use a secondary reference just in case there's something a little bit more complex on the back end of the monitor we might need to look at. All right, so we'll move on to this, uh, uh, to this cabinet right here. And this cabinet's kind of hard to get to whenever we, have, uh, whenever we have a monitor on, so I'm gonna pull this monitor off for right now just to show you a little bit better. All right, so we have a few things in here. Um, we have uh, sterile aluminum foil. We have everything that we need to manage a um, childbirth. Um, so we have bulb syringes, OB kits, things of that nature over here. We have large abdominal dressings. We could also use some of this for, uh, for uh, uh, traumas. Uh, we have hats for babies to keep them warm. We have in a really cool uh, device in there, and it's kind of like a big hot pack for a baby because it is very unsafe. Traditionally, in the past, you might have seen ambulances who take baby with mom and mom holds baby. We don't like that. In fact, the, uh, uh, there's a national consortium that says we shouldn't be doing that because what happens if we're in an ambulance wreck and that baby isn't secured in the back of an ambulance? They're just in mom's arms. Well, that baby becomes a projectile and we don't want a baby to be thrown around an ambulance in the case of a wreck. So we'll actually secure them to a certain restraint device that we have just for babies. But to keep newborns warm, which is critical for newborns, which is generally why we want to place them with their mom so that she can keep them warm and they have that kangaroo time, so to speak, um, uh, we'll put them on this hot pack. And this hot pack only goes up to a certain temp and it really keeps the baby warm while we transport them in our, in our, uh, in our restraint device. We have a trauma go bag and this might be something if we have an active shooter or a situation like this, every truck has it. We also have a larger bag that we might carry with more tourniquets, more needle decompression or the needle thoracostomy needles, um, things of that nature. We have manual blood pressure cuffs. We have a few more items here, such as uh, our, uh, this is a, kind of the ambulance pack there. It's just got some disposable sheets and some lift kits and different things like that. We have our pelvic binder. When the pelvis fractures, we might want to bind that pelvis back up because we can lose a lot of blood in our pelvis whenever we have a pelvic fracture. And so we want to bind it back up and try to tampen out all that blood bleeding out into the pelvis. All right, and then we have just uh, uh, a few more kits. Um, this is uh, our uh, amputation kit. We have a few different blocks. We have 
um, some restraint devices, even though we have a secondary restraint, some secondary restraint devices, but on all ambulances and all stretchers in EMS, uh, on our ambulances, they have restraints built into the stretcher that we, that we put on the stretcher. And so, uh, um, so they're quick access. So the, so the paramedics and EMTs, if they have a patient that's fighting, um, or, you know, they have, you know, some patients have complex seizures where they're actually very violent, but they're not really on any met, on any drugs or anything like that uh, to make them violent. They're really having a really complex seizure that's uh, unlike most seizures that we see, most generalized seizures that we see. So things of that nature, if we need to restrain them with soft restraints, that's generally what we're looking for. In here, we have some more IV access if we're, uh, sometimes we might use our bag um, in the house, but when we get back in the truck, uh, we'll pull out our IV start kit or our IV tray, and this has all of our uh, IV items. It has um, everything to secure it, our uh, constricting bands, things of that nature. Uh, every time we start an IV, we'll flush it with this little normal saline flush. All right, we have some sterile water, some bandages, some splints. Um, this, is, uh, um, this is kind of uh, a really useful splint to have. This is <laughs> uh, Every paramedic and EMT, if they have their own bag, they probably have one of these same splints in there, these padded splints in there. And then below that, we have our ventilator, which is leaps and bounds, besides the cardiac monitor, one of the most sophisticated pieces of technology that we have in the ambulance. So let me walk over here and I'll kind of show it to you and describe and tell you how we use it, all right? So traditionally, when we have a patient that needs to be ventilated or they need to be, we need to breathe for them, we've used a device called a bag valve mask, which if you're not familiar, we can get one out and I can show you. If you're not familiar, it looks a little bit like this. We package... Um, after we get our bag valve mask, we always make sure we have a few extra things in there. Um, we have a viral filter kit um, and an entitled CO2 that goes on the viral filter kit. Um, this, uh, uh, so we can monitor the carbon dioxide you're breathing out and we can also prevent any uh, viral contamination, things like that. We have the mask and we have the, the bag. All right, so this bag unfolds, this BVM unfolds like this. It hooks up to oxygen and this little uh, reservoir kind of fills up. And then there's a valve in here. At the end of this, you'll see something called a PEEP valve. And this uh, PEEP valve allows us to give certain pressures in the lungs to recruit oxygen in the lungs. Really neat tool. Um, so all of our bag valve masks are gonna have PEEP valves, our adult bag valves especially, are gonna have peat valves, viral filter, and entitled CO2 already in the bag. And what we do is we squeeze this whenever it's hooked to an endotracheal tube and we breathe for the patient. So this is a simple way to breathe for a patient. The problem is some patients have certain lung pathologies or etiologies that, man, it, it, they might not need this whole volume. They might need half of it. Most patients actually only need about this much squeeze. Um, Frequently, we wonder why they make, bag, make uh, 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 bag valve masks this big. But some patients, based on their height, um, they might need a larger amount of volume. And so the amount of volume that someone gets in their lungs aren't based on the size of the patient necessarily as far as uh, you know, their body mass, but their height generally. And so the taller the person is, probably the more volume they would get on a, on, on a breath-to-breath basis. And so... This bag valve mask is our way of giving it to them mechanically and individually. Now, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, we could give it too fast. We could breathe for them way too fast. Um, um, or we could breathe to them too slow. Or we could give them too much volume. That's not good either. Neither one of those things are good. We do a lot of training to make sure our EMTs and paramedics and AMTs know how to ventilate with a bag valve mask. This is a dangerous tool even though it looks really simple and you've probably seen it used so many times before um, but it is a really complicated tool and how much volume we give to, to patients lungs are really important. Some patients have really sensitive lungs. Some patients have lungs that are non-compliant meaning that they don't respond by breathing for them very well. 
um, because they breathed on their own. They breathed on their own for so long that they they've never had any external ventilation like this. And so we have to be careful about how much volume we give them because if their lung tissue is uh, is fragile and or they have a lung disease like COPD, um, then we might cause that lung to burst and then uh, or uh, the specific pockets in the lung alveoli to burst and then we cause air to leak out into the thoracic space which is causes a pneumothorax so we have to be very careful of that so we we train on this quite a bit now that's where the ventilator comes in handy all right so once we once the ventilator is set up and once we can use the ventilator we'd rather not use this for very long we'd like to transition you to, to this ventilator where we can pick certain settings and the technology in this ventilator this ventilator is a very sophisticated ventilator it's the safest ventilator that we found on the market. We basically set up their height, um, we set up their, uh, their, their gender, male or female, it does matter um, uh, what gender they are, and then we, uh, uh, then it, the, the inside the ventilator itself, it tells us what um, the ideal amount of volume they should be delivered or the ideal amount of pressure they should be delivered. In addition, this ventilator is so advanced that um, there is a valve that goes on the end of the ventilator. It's called an expiratory flow valve. And this valve actually tells the ventilator what our lungs are doing, whether they're obstructed or restricted. And so that tells our ventilator, hey, these lungs don't actually need this much volume. They need this much volume. We can set our rate to where we know that, hey, we're, you know, we're trying to pay attention, but the in our best intentions, we're not. We're, we're, we're trying to breathe, but we're breathing a little too fast, you know. For instance, this ventilator pr uh, uh, protects us from uh, making a human error like that and, um, and uh, uh, just sets it up automatically for us. And in addition, it tells us what our lungs are doing so we can give a safer, more effective ventilation without risk of uh, uh, any adverse reaction from, or any adverse event from the actual bag valve mask. So it's a really cool device, really cool device. Um, Anytime we use this, we want to be careful. Everything we do in EMS um, can cause harm, but it can also be life-saving. All right. So this, if used improperly or by an untrained provider, could also cause a lot of harm. That's why we do a lot of training, a lot of education for our staff members. All right. So pretty cool. In addition, we might use this. Uh, we might use this in combination with a mask. So let's say this isn't just for when people uh, can't breathe on their own. This might be used. This ventilator is going to be used for patients that can't breathe effectively on their own, meaning they're still breathing, but um, they're breathing too really too fast, or they can't get enough air in, or their oxygen saturation is really low, and we want to get that up. Uh, or they have uh, re uh, some recruitment issues. So this tool we can use, we can, uh, uh, we can apply it to this mask that would go over their face and we would give them something called CPAP or BiPAP. So it's continuous positive airway pressure or bi-level positive airway pressure. So this mask helps us provide that same thing that you're gonna get in the hospital. In fact, these, these ventilators I think are, are top quality. They're the, things that, they're the ventilators you're gonna see in ICUs around this area. Uh, really great ventilator, really sophisticated piece of equipment. Provides a lot of value to those COPD patients, any of those patients that have lung problems. Um, we can really do pretty much the same thing that the emergency department is going to do before we actually get there. And that means that they're going to have shorter stays, the outcomes are going to be better, and our patients are going to feel a lot better a lot faster. And so, uh, really good devices. If you're familiar with a CPAP device, you might use at home for sleep apnea. Very similar to that. You might even use a BiPAP where there's more pressure when you breathe in and less pressure when you breathe out or vice versa. And so uh, it does that, all of that stuff too. Really, really sophisticated piece of equipment. A lot of STEM involved in these two pieces of equipment. A lot of programming knowledge, a lot of manufacturing knowledge, and a lot of uh, um, engineering knowledge go into these pieces of equipment. That's why they're, they've got pretty hefty hot price tag to boot. All right. Back here, we'll move to the airway cabinet and we'll talk about it a little bit as well. Our airway cabinet, you've already seen that I pulled two pieces of equipment out of the airway cabinet that we use on a daily basis. 
We have all of our oxygen tools, so we have nasal cannulas. Nasal cannulas would go in our nose. Non-rebreathers, which would be the mask that had the oxygen reservoirs underneath them that would go over our nose and our mouth. We have, um, uh, uh, in, uh, we have atomizers um, or uh, nebulizers, I mean. The nebulizers are for patients that might have COPD or uh, something of that nature where they, ha they take breathing treatments on a frequent basis. We can give breathing treatments that way with Zopinex, Albuterol, or Ipetropium Bromide. And, um, and then up here we have smaller bag valve masks. You already saw that big bag valve mask. This is one for a, a child. We have one for an infant as well in here. And so we have one for a, a little tiny infant or a newborn baby. So they're pretty small. We have nasal airways. Nasal airways uh, will put lubrication on this airway and put it in someone's nose if they're not responding. And uh, we need, uh, sometimes the tongue can block ventilations when we're trying to ventilate them. And so we might put this in here when we're providing bag valve mass ventilations to provide a, uh, a better uh, connection from the mouth, the nose, to the actual vocal cords, to the lungs. Oral airways, these are airways that come in all kinds of sizes, same with the nasal pharyngeal airways. These are airways we might put in someone's mouth to get the tongue out of the way so we can breathe more effectively for them. We have suction catheters. These suction catheters would go down either an endotracheal tube or down someone's nose to suction out any mucus or anything like that that they have in their lungs or in the back of their throat. We have NG tubes. The NG tubes would go down into their stomach um, and it would uh, suction out some of that uh, uh, stuff that we have down in there. We have too much of that. Those nasogastric tubes. Um, we have some more endotracheal tubes. We have the circuits for our ventilators there. So these are extra circuits. Uh, this is where the, uh, uh, the air comes out, goes into the ventilator, and then comes out these tubes. And then when the patient uh, expires, that'll go back through, and that's what it'll go through that uh, expiratory flow valve to tell us what the lungs are doing. And we have a few more uh, filters up here and uh, different things of that nature. Over here, underneath this cabinet, we have our suction unit. And our suction unit, we would hook our, either our nasogastric tube, uh, our, uh, uh, um, our uh, uh, any of the other suction tubes that we may use. You might hook it here. We have a specific device uh, called a Ducanto catheter. And, uh, and so it's a large bore suction device that if the patient has a lot of vomit in their mouth and we're trying to intubate them, or they have a lot of uh, secretions, um, then we'll have to use that device to get a lot of stuff out. Um, so sometimes, you know, we, we generally don't respond to people. It's not, we're not in an OR, so you're not fasting for 12 hours before your surgery. So most of the time when we have to intubate you, you got stuff in your mouth you probably ate a few hours before, and whatever you just ate might be coming back up. So we want to get that out of your mouth so we can properly intubate you and prevent any of that from going in your lungs if possible. Uh, we have our oxygen. And so this uh, oxygen... Uh, tree is connected to our oxygen tank in the back here that you that you'll see um, and so if we can deliver a certain amount of oxygen up to 15 liters or greater and then we have our display panel and this just turns off the lights um, it change we have our uh, air conditioning uh, uh, interface where we can change the uh, change the uh, condition of the uh, the box so we can make it hot or cold different things of that nature and then we have our radio that we generally communicate with the hospitals with or uh, other entities that we might have coming to the county or in the county at that time. Um, down here we have, this is our protocol book. And uh, we've every ambulance has protocols on the ambulance. In addition, they have them on their phones. Um, we have them on the laptops um, or their uh, mobile data terminals. We have them on pretty much any anything we can get them on so they can always reference their protocols. Paramedics, EMTs, and AEMTs work under the jurisdiction of a physician. So we have a medical director. Uh, his name is Dr. Hollis Hilty. Uh, he is an ER physician, and uh, we work under his license. Now, paramedics are licensed on their own as well. However, they do require a physician to function. And so that physician says that we're able to work under standard operating guidelines. So these are all protocols for different patient types 
for instance, we have uh, a diabetic emergency protocol. And as you can see, it just walks us through what we should do for diabetic emergencies. Um, we have different just different types of protocols that we may use for any different patient encounter down to pediatrics all the way up to adults. Um, these are really helpful. As you can tell, they operate under a lot of protocols. And so um, they might have to reference them from time to time because it is hard to remember every single protocol when we don't go on every single one of these types of emergencies all the time. So that might want to reference that protocol to make sure that they're not missing something. Um, they're not missing a piece of critical therapy or not missing a piece of critical diagnostic. Uh, and so it's, it's important that they have these on here just for those references. Um, we might not always go on uh, uh, every single uh, type of emergency under the sun, and so it's important that they have that reference. We have some gloves and different things of that nature. And then behind the stretcher, connected to the stretcher, is one of the tools I was talking about here. I'll unbutton it real quick. This is one of the restraint devices that we have attached to the stretcher at all times. And so this restraint device just, it's soft, it's padded. We don't really want to hurt people when we restrain them. We just want them to stop hurting themselves generally or stop them from trying to hurt us. And so this, uh, this helps us uh, do that really quickly, whether we're in the back of the ambulance or on scene. And so, really cool device that we, we can use there. So they're at strategic points in the, on the stretcher, so an EMT or paramedic can access them at any time and quickly restrain a patient that is, uh, um, that is, uh, uh, that is threatening them or threatening themselves. All right. On the back of the stretcher, we have a tank of oxygen. Now, we have a lot of oxygen on the ambulance. We'll always have oxygen on the ambulance because it's one of the most frequently used medications that we have. This is our airway bag and so we're going to take this in every call. This airway bag is going to have a certain amount of uh, uh, tools that we're going to have uh, nasopharyngeal airways, we're going to have oral airways, we're going to have medications, we're going to have uh, nebulizing medications, we're going to have our uh, uh, we're going to have our uh, 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 atomizing devices, things of that nature. Here it is. And here we have another tank of oxygen. Again, this is going to go with us to the patient. Um, it's going to go in with this uh, go bag or this medic bag. We're going to have an oxygen wrench that allows us to change the oxygen cylinders or to turn them off or on. And then we're going to have some other cool tools. You, these were in the airway bag. I didn't show you because I knew we were going to show you on these. These are our secondary airways or our superglottic airways. These are called eye gel devices, and they're literally um, just soft gel that if we can't intubate you and we don't want to put a needle in your neck, this is our secondary tool where we put this down and then it occludes your vocal cords, and then we breathe through this outlet right here, and we can even suction. Um, through this tool as well, and then we secure it to your to your uh, to your head. We have different sizes; they go down all the way to little tiny kids, um, and so uh, it's really essential that we have those tools as well. All right, and then up here we have just extra stock. Um, uh, we have extra stock of suction catheters, things of that nature. You move this ALS back. Over here, we also have some quick tools. We might have some IV catheters. We might have some constricting bands, different tools that we might need really quickly that we don't have time to reach up for, or we can just grab over here. We have different types of paperwork that we might need to use, uh, protocols that are quick reference, things of that nature in here uh, if we need them. We have linens that we might need for patients, so blankets, things of that nature. We have our portable suction device. This would go in the house with us. It's the same as that, but a little less powerful. And so we have that in there. We have more linens. Uh, we have some safety, so some PPE supplies. And then we also have our pediatric bag. Now our pediatric bag will go in all pediatric emergencies. It's the same. Uh, to some degree as our ALS bag or our medic bag, but it's going to have more pediatric specific supplies um, and pediatric specific sizes of supplies. 
because we don't want to go rummaging through a whole bag to find pediatric supplies when we're probably trying to operate really quickly when we can just go through one bag that only has pediatric supplies. Um, and I guess that's it for the inside of an ambulance. Um, again, my name is Jamie Goodpastor. I'm the chief here, and if you have any other questions, feel free to contact me. Thanks for watching. If you would like to see more STEM with Chantel videos, check out this playlist. If you want to know when JCPL puts out more content, click the subscribe button and the notification bell.